What's up, guys? It's Q&A time on January 7th, 2019. Uh, open Q&A this week, so got a variety of questions, and I will get right into them. All right, so we'll jump over to Facebook, and first question is, um, following Joe Jeffrey's post on or with the study about rest times, what is your general rest times between sets? <clears throat> Uh, okay, so the rest times between sets, normally my recommendation is rest as much as you need to. Um, there's going to be a fine line between just sitting around and then resting uh, optimally because you don't want to rest. You don't want your rest periods to be so short that you're compromising performance on your, you know, on your following your next sets. Um, that cumulative fatigue is going to add up if you're just taking, you know, you're doing four sets and you're only resting 60 seconds i mean by set two maybe even two or three or four you know your your performance is going to go way down um so i like to let you know let uh let breathing return to normal let heart rate return to normal or, or relatively normal close to it at least um and that's totally gonna vary on uh, the types of exercises you're doing i mean if you're we're talking like a compound exercise like squats, I mean, that's going to take a lot longer than a bicep curl. So keep that in mind. Um, and I might have set rest times in select situations like where we're just doing purely metabolic work. We might do some short rest times, but in general, rest by feel. <clears throat> okay, next one. Uh, they asked another question. Also, second book I should read after Green Eggs and Ham. I gave them Green Eggs and Ham as a book recommendation for 2019 uh i truthfully that was just i was obviously joking and i'm not much of a reader to be completely honest like i'll read little bits here and there you know like a study or an article or something something that i'm interested in at that moment and want to want to read or learn more about or answer a question or whatever but i'm not one to read books like i never like to read books in school i don't like to read books now not because not because I can't read or anything or I'm a slow reader. It's just that I, you know, I don't have much time for one. And secondly, it's just not something that interests me that much. But there are some good books out there. If you want to talk about like physique related books, I'd probably check out Lyle McDonald's book, uh, the women's book. I do have that on audiobook. I've listened to most of it. I, I put it on here and there and listen to bits of it. Um, Something like Scott Stevenson's, Dr. Scott's book, uh, How to Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach, I think is the name of it. I'm sure you can Google it. I've heard really good things about it. I have not read it, but I've heard good things from people that I trust, so um, might be another one to check out. <clears throat> All right. Advice and recommendations for someone that recently just got IBS in nutrition, supplementation, lifestyle, etc. Okay. So I'm not sure if they were diagnosed by a doctor or what, but IBS is kind of a blanket diagnosis to be completely honest. It's not, there's not really like one thing that causes IBS. It's just somebody, you, you can think of IBS as somebody that has a very finicky digestive system and they have problems with a lot of uh, stressors, you know, on their GI tract, hence the name irritable bowel syndrome. So, um, I mean, honestly, a lot of the, a lot of the lifestyle factors and nutrition and supplementation factors are going to be very similar to anyone else with digestive issues. It's just going to be a fact of monitoring um, elimination foods and things of that nature. That's, I mean, that's number one right off the bat. Go through and eliminate foods that you don't you don't agree that don't agree with you. And that's not just things that like directly um, bother your stomach upon consuming them. It could be things like that that make your skin flare up for example so people that have um poor or gut permeability so like leaky gut have uh can get skin flare-ups like eczema psoriasis things like that can be connected to those um gi issues same with irritable bowel even things that that feel um excuse me feel like they digest good but maybe make you uh give you a ton of brain fog those could be uh you know, foods that are, you're intolerant to, I guess you could say. So foods are number one. Keep a food journal if you need to figure out what's digesting best with you. <clears throat> and then you can fill in supplementation around 
uh, around the the foods. So, for example, if you digest carbohydrates poorly or you digest fats poorly, you might take something that's going to help with um, digestion of those macronutrients or protein. You might need to uh, enhance the pH environment in your stomach. You might need to take betaine, HCL, for example. Um, you may need to take, I've talked about delimiting before for bile production and fat digestion. So something like that. So that's kind of depends on, you know, if once you've narrowed down the food you best you can, now you know, okay, right, this is where my gaps are still at. I need to fill in these gaps. So that's how you can look at that. Uh, lifestyle factors. Biggest thing there is just not being too sympathetically driven. So not, um, not over consuming stimulants, not being too anxious and moving around and stuff during meals, like people that like pace when they eat and are always doing stuff when they eat, try not to do that. I understand that people are busy and I understand, you know, sometimes you can't prevent everything, but even if it's something as simple as doing uh, 10 to 20 seconds of soft belly breathing before you eat, because you know, you're a little, you know, your brain's a little in high gear and chances are, if that's the case, then you're sympathetically driven. You need to activate the parasympathetic nervous system and really get really get everything calm so your digestive tract can do what it's supposed to do. So that, I mean, those are going to be the main lifestyle factors. Uh, PNS activation is going to be the biggest thing, and that comes in so many forms. It could be anything from just combating anxiety to, like I said, talked about uh, calming down before you eat. Um, I mean, if you're just a generally overall very stressed person, you have poor sleep. I mean, all that stuff contributes to um, imbalance in the nervous system, which is going to cause imbalance in digestion. So, um, yeah, you got to even people that they sleep when their sleep improves, their digestion improves. You wouldn't think the two are connected, but they they absolutely are because of the nervous system connection there. So think about those factors. <sighs> All right. <laughs> Who has the biggest face now? Joe Jeffrey or JP? <laughs> um, why do androgens make your head grow? And what can be done other than PED abstinence to avoid getting a buffalo head? Head size increase anecdote. Uh... I assume it's just that there's receptors, you know, there's receptors in those areas. So, um, think of the hands to people that their hands that grow and, um, different like feet, different areas that grow growth hormone does that too. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm there obviously has to be receptors somewhere, um, that's utilizing hormones or otherwise it, you know, they probably wouldn't grow. So, <clears throat> I don't know who has the biggest head. My head's pretty big. Luckily, I have broad shoulders, so that helps a lot. But my head's pretty big, and it's always been big. I was that kid. I tried to play t-ball when I was a little kid. I couldn't. I had to wear the adult helmets, and none of the football helmets fit me. So I've always had a gigantic head. Joe's head is kind of big. <laughs> but my, I don't know. Mine might be as big or bigger, but I've never seen JP's head in person. But it does look pretty big. Um, but yeah, as far as the androgen thing goes, I mean, it's a matter of there's receptors. There has to be receptors to uptake those androgens somewhere. Um, that's causing those, the, you know, skeletal structure to grow, which is, it's, it is a strange thing though, because you would think that it would make your whole body grow, like make your spine, you make you grow taller or something, but, uh, that's not the case. So, um, all right. Move over to Instagram. Thoughts on programming in terms of a four to one or five to one accumulation to deload paradigm. Accumulation via increasing sets, reps, and decreasing reps in reserve. And then auto regulated deloads after the accumulation. So, what they're saying is four to one ratio is four weeks on of accumulation, one week off. Uh, or five on one off. So, okay. Uh, again, I I always have problems with set progression and deloading schemes. I just can't, except for select scenarios with strength athletes, perhaps. I 
I just don't like them in bodybuilders. I just, uh, there's too many variables. There's too many stressors. There's too many things that we can't control like outside life stressors and things that will contribute to or cut into our recovery ability. And you can't always predict these things. It's not just a matter of, all right, I'm going to add more training. So I'm going to need to recover more. Well, if something happens in your life schedule, anything, I mean, that changes things drastically. So I let that determine deloading typically more so than the training. But as far as the, the accumulation scheme goes, I mean, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Um, but if you're constantly increasing sets, reps and decreasing reps in reserve, I'd argue that you probably are going to, uh, overreach a lot quicker than if you kept those things, um, the same and just progressed strength wise. But, but again, I mean, you could progress a little bit more in four weeks and deload more often, or you could progress a little bit less and deload less often. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty much splitting hairs at that point. Personally, I like the progression scheme that allows you to progress, but not de- you know, not overreach, uh, super quickly. And usually I'll program in overreaching intentionally. Um, like someone's kind of at a rest period coming up vacation, something that they're not going to train. So I might overreach them intentionally beforehand, uh, things like that, which you could plan over intentional overreaching at any time. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm have a hard time getting behind the set, um, accumulation and deloading schemes like that. So it's hard for me to comment on that because I don't have a ton of anecdote to give you on them because I just don't use them that often. So all right, next question. Let's see what we have here. Do you think either SSRIs or uh, benzodiazepines, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but I just call them benzos. Um, Xanax, for example, would be a benzo, common one. Have any significant negative effect on bodybuilding? Thanks for always pumping out the kick ass content. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so direct negative effects versus indirect. I mean, indirectly, indirectly benzos are extremely addictive. Um, I mean, anything. All right. So I'm not playing like going to play doctor or psychiatrist or anything, but I mean, anything that has the potential to make you feel different cognitively, Um, In terms of neurotransmitters, so dopamine or serotonin, for example, like SSRI, uh, GABA levels like a benzo, um, any of that has potential for addiction. So uh, because you might like it, it might make you feel better. So, you know, whether it's physical addiction or psychological addiction, that's a different story, but it has the potential. So um, indirectly, sure, I mean, if you become addicted to these things directly SSRIs have um, showed some negatives towards hormones like specifically testosterone for example lowering it I mean if someone's on testosterone I guess it doesn't really matter Um, it could I guess it could probably uh, cause um, imbalance in neurotransmitters like I said and you could potentially have a harder time getting in the mood to train and do things like that because those serotonin drugs can make you kind of like, you know, sleepy or zombie like sometimes. Um, depends on how you use them, you know, are you using them daily or are you using them as needed, especially the benzos, you know, it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a big difference between somebody that takes a little bit here and there versus somebody that has to take, uh, you know, a pretty large dose every single night just to go to sleep. So, um, I would probably say that the indirect negatives are going to be more, um, more deleterious than anything. And anything that's going to take away from quality of life potentially could, you know, could obviously take away from physique goals. Uh, now, now they could add to quality of life as well. I mean, I'm not, thing about a lot of these, you know, some people that have true chemical imbalances, they, they're going to have a hard time. They are going to feel better on them, but then obviously there are the downsides or they can just not take them and kind of deal with it and maybe use some over the counter options and get the 
do the best they can. Um, like myself, for example, I was prescribed first, very first uh, drug I was prescribed was Zoloft, which is an SSRI. And there are a little bit better ones now, but I was probably like seven or eight years old, which is, you know, ridiculously young to be on that kind of medication. But, um, yeah, I mean, and I, and I've used Wellbutrin as well, which is a dopamine drug and they no doubt, especially I didn't really like the Zoloft. So I, I assume that while well, I was young for one, and I assume that uh, I probably don't have as much of a serotonin issue as I do a dopamine issue. And the Wellbutrin made me feel really good. I did like it. I just don't like, I didn't like the idea of um, potentially needing more over the course of time. So, you know, I tried to I do what I can without it. Uh, but I probably have a legitimate chemical imbalance and just don't produce the dopamine that I need. So you're going to have people like that. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to say whether or not anyone should take them because we're kind of going down a different, you know, that's a different topic, but just uh, weigh the pros and cons for sure. And like I said, the indirect negatives that the drugs are going to have, which they would have on for anybody, are probably going to be the things that are going to translate into some negatives for your um, physique goals. Not necessarily like, oh, I took Xanax, so... All my, I lost all my muscle. No, it's not going to be anything that direct and drastic. Okay. <clears throat> all right. How about free meals and gaining phases? Is there any actual purpose? Um, like someone like yourself, for example, close to 5,000 calories, what's their purpose? Uh, physiologically nothing really. I mean, there's nothing now <clears throat> to be honest with when I'm in that kind of caloric range, like I would think I was around 5,200, maybe 51, 5,200. I did my appetite's really bad. Like those days with anything, I would eat less. If I were to do a free meal, I'd probably end up eating less calories to be completely honest, just because you go by appetite and the appetite's not that much. Whereas, you know, if you're starved, you can eat it, you can eat anything and it all tastes good and you can eat a lot of it. So, um, yeah, I mean, physiologically, there's really enough, there's no benefit to it. Really. You could, you could use it like to introduce like a dirtier foods to get a calorie influx there. You could, if you wanted to, if I had someone do like, I do have, <clears throat> uh, for example, so I have a couple people that do two free meals a week and those are intentional and I don't have them track them and I have them eat like really calorically dense stuff. Um, and that's on purpose because they're already eating like 5,500 or 6,000 calories on a regular basis. So they need that and that helps. Uh, but we don't want to do it too often because we don't want to bombard the GI tract with too much too much inflammation, too much junk, but a little bit, I mean, it's not, it's not really a, a big deal and short, you know, in a short window like that. Um, but nope, not much, nothing, nothing advantageous. It's just more psychological for most people. Um, yep. So also to add to that, Sorry, my dog has a bone. <laughs> to add to that, you could you could go check out the Mind Body Broadcast refeed episode, and we talked about how refeeds are beneficial and when they're beneficial, and how to structure them, and how single cheat meals really aren't beneficial. So you might be interested in listening to that if you haven't already. <clears throat> okay, last one. Oh wait, one, two more. Let's see. What is the point of waist trainers? Can they even produce a great enough result to make it worth buying one, using one? Okay, so waist trainers and a corset are going to be a little bit different. A waist trainer like the neoprene sweat belts, they get tight, but they're normally not as tight as a corset. Yeah, you could use them for... Um, 
Like if you use a topical fat burner that has the hembine in it, for example, it might help keep that stuff in the area. You get that heat. People like the heat and the sweat. Um, helps, but like I said, it helps keep the stuff from like running down you when you sweat. Uh, last thing you want is a topical product that might have like capsaicin in it or something to be running down into your crotch. It's probably not what you want. So that helps. Um, no, I mean, it's not going to cause the waist trainer itself. It's not going to cause any site specific fat loss. And a uh, corset is, you know, obviously going to bring in, depending on how long it is, if it's going all the way up to ribs, it could affect that. But it's going to help maybe bring your waist in a little bit. Um, I've seen it work, whether it's bad or good. Uh, it's kind of a different topic. I don't think it's a good thing all the time to be messing with your bone structure, especially, but have seen people successfully use them. Um, so, yeah. <sighs> Last one. How is your current off-season diet and supplementation. So, so this one I said, that would be about an hour video in and of itself. My supplementation is a lot like my drawers full of supplements. So it's not like, um, you know, it's not something I could really go over and right here in a couple minutes, but nutrition, I ended up, I actually just pulled back, um, do this fat loss phase, probably turn it into a prep. We'll see. Um, but I was at about 5,200 calories, I think, was where I ended at. Uh, macros were 450 protein, which was a lot. Probably won't go that high again. Uh, six Over 600 carbs and like 130 fat or something. I don't know. I'd have to go look and add it up. I forget now. But... I was still timing nutrients as much as, you know, as much as I could, uh, not combining, uh, like carbs around training and, and whatnot. You do tend to spread things out a little bit more when food's that high. Um, but that was the gist of the nutrition and yeah, supplementation makes mostly based around health. I don't change my over the counter supplements much throughout the year. Uh, really other than like some fat loss things and various stuff added in during fat loss phases, but most of it's based around health and digestion. Now there were some things I had to do digestion wise, like ramp up some digestive subs to be able to handle that. My appetite was not good at that point. I mean, I didn't feel like I was force feeding necessarily because I was very selective with my food options and I was really using low volume calorically dense foods, but, uh, I was using like, you know, six caps of betaine per meal just to have, just to digest that food, you know, high protein. So, um, yeah, any, I, like I said, I could do a specific video on it though. It's not really something I could break down hundred percent right here, but that's it guys. That is all this week. I appreciate the variety of questions and we'll talk to you guys next week.